I'm introducing, this is Dr. Scott Smith. Um, Scott grew up in Boulder, Colorado and attended medical school at the University of Colorado. He went to public health school at Harvard University, University, where an interest in tropical public health was further developed, leading to a year-long adventure on a Fulbright scholarship in Cali, Colombia, seeking improved diagnostic technologies to understand the epidemiology of leishmaniasis and river blindness. He completed residency, then a fellowship at Stanford University in Medicine, then Infectious Disease and Geographic Medicine. Scott practices at Kaiser in Redwood City, California, where he oversees the travel medicine services locally, but also is developing regionalization of vaccine use and the travel medical ser medicine service for Kaiser Northern California. He co-chairs the biennial National Conference on Preparing International Travelers. He teaches at Stanford Medical School in the Microbiology and Immunology Division and directs a course for undergraduates in human biology entitled Parasites and Pestilence, Public Health Challenges. He was re recently presented the Bloomfield Award for Recognition of Excellence in the Teaching of Clinical Medicine at Stanford School of Medicine. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Smith. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this is great. There's a few people here. I feel like I'm talking on C-SPAN to uh, <laughs> an audience. Um, so I, I hope I can make this relevant to you guys who have sat down and answered questions. I'm going to just share uh, what the Travel Medicine Clinic does. I, as Matt said, come from Redwood City, and it's an international world port. We see a lot of people, immigrants and people in uh, this area, of course. It's one of the more uh, diverse areas in the petri dish we know as the world, um, people coming from all over. Oh, sorry. Liu is the clicker. Um, so the objective is really to define uh, travel medicine. Uh, it's a specialty within uh, the practice of uh, medicine. And also, I just want to show you, illustrate some diseases, common diseases that travelers get. And uh, so febrile illness, diarrhea, and skin infections. and then. Um, lastly, I want to discuss the limitations of mapping and show you uh, a little bit about maps and how we get the information that we get and why we believe in it, um, uh, and maybe we shouldn't. So, oh, use the clicker. So anyway, the objective here is to stay alive, and uh, uh, you live only once if you live right. Once is enough. Uh, and. Uh, what this, this discipline does is try and apply uh, the things that we know, the technologies we have, the vaccines, the medicines, to uh, risks that you will come into contact with when you're traveling internationally. So um, in fact, there's a travel medicine uh, society, and it basically uh, brings together these, these disciplines, including preventive medicine, epidemiology, public health, um, and, and uh, this, this new, relatively newer field then addresses the issues that I'm going to walk you through and illustrate with some real cases that I've seen in Redwood City. But just to give a sense, if you were traveling, 100,000 travelers go abroad for one month, um, this is what might happen in terms of their medical issues. Uh, half of them, it's estimated, will develop some sort of health problem during the course of their trip. Um, many fewer, 8,000, 8% will actually seek a physician's help, and 5,000 will be confined to bed, so a bit more serious. Uh, 1,100 will be incapacitated in their work. Uh, 300 will have to be hospitalized. 50 will have been air evacuated, and uh, one will die. So, um, ha you know, preparing for this is important. And then, what what are the things that cause those outcomes? Well, uh, traveler's diarrhea, by far and away, is the the biggest one and uh, people are concerned. Respiratory infections, we vaccinated against flu. Uh, malaria, 2%, uh, if you stay a month in malarious areas in Africa, 2% will potentially uh, get, or it's observed in West Africa, will get malaria. And then uh, some other things as well. So um, <clears throat> what we do in the pre-travel consultation is see where you go, what your risk is, and what the tools are that we have. And using constraint uh, sort of analysis, we decide what uh, would be best to, to uh, immunize you against, chemoprophylax against, and, 
advise in terms of your uh, uh, <coughs> behavior. So these are some of the sources to prepare a traveler. If you just Google travel you know, medicine, try and figure out what you might need in preparation for your trip to Zimbabwe, and I'm gonna walk through that example, you will most likely come in contact with the CDC website. And I'm gonna show you the, the screenshots here. And then there are other uh, proprietary softwares that you can actually buy and uh, many travel clinics use that are a little bit more specific. And then if you're really an expert, you can Google and use Google Earth to get uh, very uh, defined risks for specific diseases, and I'll show you an example of that. So first one is just the CDC. You go to the CDC website, and you see this big map of the world, and basically you can click on where you might go. So I just clicked on Zimbabwe, and I'm gonna sort of illustrate a trip and what, uh, how to prepare to go to uh, Zimbabwe. Um, first of all, it gives general information uh, for travelers, and uh, you, can, you can also then uh, look up about the political situation. Um, then what I want to focus on is the medical interventions or things that you might do in order to uh, 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 get, get vaccinated properly. And so there's a list, and basically it's just a, a, a list of things that uh, um, you might vaccinate against. And then the second other big category is malaria. There are a number of options uh, for, for malaria drugs. It doesn't say which ones to take or how or any of the details. So these proprietary softwares that the actual uh, travel medicine people use, actually they, they, they do uh, uh, take information from the, the CDC collates from WHO and other uh, sources, but it puts it in an order that helps uh, a little bit better. So you would choose a destination. Here we are, Zimbabwe, at the end of the list. And then it would uh, give you a little bit more specifically uh, requirements. And so always the yellow fever, because that's an international law and a requirement, will come up and tell you if you need it. And <clears throat> a little bit about the, the area. This is a map that it shows. And this is the, the malaria area. And it's not entirely uh, covered, but uh, um, the yellow represents where the risk is uh, for malaria. And you can see Harare, the capital where we were going, and this area is actually higher elevation, so there's no malaria risk, and that has to do with mosquito distribution. Another, uh, this is a malaria atlas project, which is between Oxford and some people at Google, um, <coughs> uh, is, is, is uh, a little bit more detailed and has to do with the species of malaria and a number of environmental factors and how uh, diseases might move. And this shows with dots by years uh, where cases have been reported in this uh, particular area. So um, these, uh, these, these sources are kind of used in order to make recommendations. It's pretty uh, general. And so you see these political zones sort of colored in based on pretty scanty data. Um, and another <clears throat> source actually is just the spectrum of disease reported in travelers. So if there are <clears throat> this article last uh, January 2006 looked at 17,000 travelers year <clears throat> uh, for, for a long uh, uh, period of time and mapped where they went and which diseases or syndromes they actually came back with. And that, that, that kind of reporting through GeoSentinel has been really helpful uh, to understand where we might focus resources to assist people and what the risks really are. So they looked at these 17,000 ill return travelers and it turns out <clears throat> that that is, represents 8%. Remember I said 8,000 of 100,000. So 8% of uh, travelers to the developing world require medical care during or after travel. So what I'm gonna do just for fun is show you some common things that uh, uh, happen, we observe in our travel clinic, and I took the top three on this list. So it's fever, diarrhea, and dermatologic disorders. And I see you're finished with lunch, so we can almost, we can uh, see some gross pictures. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> so <clears throat> we'll start off with systemic fever. And uh, again, this is the top of the list, and there's a short uh, list of, of uh, febrile illnesses that could potentially be prevented with our uh, vaccines or what have you. So here's yellow fever in Africa. Look at this map. I mean, it's yellow. That means yellow fever. So 
if you look a little more closely, here's South America, also yellow fever. Um, if you look closely, well, and you look at reported cases, there were only, there's about one case to the in a return travel to the United States per year for the last few years. And those actually, uh, most of them, four out of five died. And it's a very serious disease. But these maps are used not because of necessarily risk to an individual. That's, by the way, a, a very small risk, but it's a big one because you die. Um, and the other reason to look at these maps is because there's political, there's law and political reason because if you travel from Rio de Janeiro, even though you're not in an endemic area, to an, any other country on <clears throat> the same trip, they'll, in, they'll require that you have yellow fever. In fact, you know you carry around a vaccine card and it's yellow. You, if anybody traveled abroad, it's yellow. And that's because of yellow fever and the WHO uh, rules about it. And this says all maps are wrong, but some are useful. So there are different ways you would use a map, and this is a sort of big picture uh, representation of uh, how you would decide about giving somebody a vaccine. So anyway, these are some of the systemic uh, illnesses that you could um, come up with. In fact, the top list that I showed you to the people traveling to developing countries. And this is why it's happening. If man had been meant to fly, he would have been created much narrower and with shorter legs. You know, we're moving all over the place and uh, potentially carrying disease from one endemic area to a, another uh, zone. And if there are competent vectors, then that's, that's a big issue. This is uh, <clears throat> the endemic countries. And uh, you can see it's just at risk. Everything is red. Obviously, it doesn't take into account all of the nuances and different kinds of malaria. Uh, it's just, it says malaria risk. Well, there are different kinds of malaria. The kind that kills you up top here, falciparum, is very different than uh, plasmodium, which is the vast majority of malaria. And um, if you look at a more recent uh, map, I think three years later, it actually details looking not so much at the geopolitical boundaries. All of Mexico is no longer colored in, but rather just the more uh, at risk because of distribution of vectors. Um, and it sort of classifies by endemicity. So you can see right here is the, the most dangerous, and it's actually got falciparum. This is a, a parasite. Malaria is a parasite. And here it is it, after a red blood cell has been exploded and the, it's, it's being released into the bloodstream. And uh, malaria kills in that way by uh, destroying red cells and causing other tissue damages <clears throat> as it replicates. This is a sick child in Zambia. Um, there was a big spread about malaria in National Geographic uh, very recently. And one of the interesting things that uh, they did is they represented all of the people that die in one day in Africa. And here they are. And it, take a guess how many people are standing here for this picture. <laughs> it's supposed to be 3,000. So that's how many people die a day in Africa from malaria. So it's a big deal. Um, it affects disproportionately more uh, kids, young, young people. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot of tension also because of global warming and issues of changing boundaries with it, uh, where, where these uh, uh, insect, where, where the um, vectors can reside. OK, so what do we do to prevent it? And how do you stop it? Well, uh, <clears throat> here we are trying to figure that out. And a cloud of mosquitoes surrounding us. Smith, wait a minute, you fool. This isn't what I said to bring. Um, <clears throat> so there are a number of things that you can do, steps on a personal level to prevent it. And that's what we would advise in a travel clinic. And here we are, uh, my wife and I, uh, sitting in Ivory Coast, scared as heck. Uh, what are we doing? So, oh no, bed net is one, and uh, DEET to the skin is another, and permethrin clothing, so you basically spray clothing so that the mosquitoes don't uh, uh, bother you uh, with, with uh, both in the bed net, but also in the clothing that you wear. Um, and then lastly, chemoprophylaxis, which simply means you take a drug every day if the mosquito bites, it will actually stop a uh, parasite from uh, developing in your lung, I, I mean in your liver. Uh, this mosquito has already taken a blood meal too late um, and is flying away. It's a female Anopheles mosquito. Um, and here's the proboscis staring us down. Uh, 
about to uh, potentially transmit malaria. So a lot of things, there's a lot of folklore also about um, how to how to prevent it. A lot of people recall in their childhood, I don't know, using these, these citronella candles and such to, uh, to avoid it. This is another way. Uh, don't use that. Uh, doesn't, sorry. Um, this is the permethrin. You actually spray and uh, treat your clothes. And that, that uh, um, uh, works very effectively. And it's actually the same chemical marketed for a whole bunch of different insect prevention. Around here, the advertisements are with respect to Lyme disease and ticks. And so it's the same chemical, but um, it, it does a very good job of repelling uh, the dangers. So anyway, to summarize, there's a bunch of personal things I mentioned that you can do, and then chemical prophylaxis. And there's a list of medicines, and you would have to sort out which ones would be appropriate based on uh, both where you're going because of sensitivities, but uh, what you can tolerate as an individual uh, based on your medical history. This is just demonstrating bed nets and dipping and how you have to do that. It's kind of a, a big deal because uh, um, it takes an intervention. It's, it's not a public health level, but rather an individual level thing to make a difference. Supernet. This is a really great super, super net. There, there are lots of public health level uh, strategies about um, controlling malaria. For example, not taxing uh, the nets that people have access to and encouraging people to use them properly and during the right time. And uh, particularly those who are most vulnerable, like pregnant women and kids under five years old. Um, <clears throat> so uh, again, Treatment of people is another strategy that actually takes a lot more uh, infrastructure and is, is difficult. Mosquito abatement, in fact, our CDC was established in the 1950s specifically with a program to eradicate malaria. And so they were involved with draining marshes, control, doing mosquito uh, control using DDT and so on. Um, and then other, other things, tire campaigns to get rid of uh, breeding, that's uh, been an issue, for example, with dengue in uh, Cuba. Um, and then vaccines are a big topic. Um, I don't know if you saw the news last week, the HIV vaccine is a big failure. They're having a meeting with Tony Fauci. It's, vaccines are very difficult also in malaria, and it has to do with the complexity of the protein surfaces. It's not a virus. Um, but there, it has a lot of different uh, phases as it migrates through your body. And so vaccines aren't always uh, an easy thing to, uh, to uh, make work. So anyway, this is a list of drugs. And you can see with this map um, the areas that are sensitive or not. So uh, for example, uh, chloroquine sensitivity, chloroquine, the oldest drug for malaria, works very well in these zones. And then it's chloroquine resistant in most of the rest of the world. And so you have to use the other three that I listed. And then there's an area here that uh, there's a great deal of resistance in the, the Thai borders. And so doxycycline or other things might be used. So mefloquine or larium, um, and then atovaquone perguanol, which is malarone, and primaquine are some of the choices in terms of uh, chemoprophylaxis. This says, are there any side effects to these pills apart from bankruptcy? Malarone is super expensive, and uh, chloroquine is dirt cheap. Um, so that's another issue to be considered when you're uh, preparing somebody. So again, if you can give the cheap good one, chloroquine works, that's fine. But then you have to think about the particular areas. So uh, again, uh, constraint mapping. All right, so now we're to the next uh, topic here, diarrhea. Sorry, I hope you finish your lunch almost. Um, <clears throat> so remember on our list of all of the return deal travelers, this was a big deal. And there are things that you can do to prevent uh, uh, diarrhea. And one of them is a vaccine. And that's a vaccine against a bacterial caused uh, uh, pathogen called typhoid. And um, <clears throat> salmonella typhi. So diagnosing it, I'm not going to go into. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I saw this sign. Uh, come check out our stool samples. I have a totally different viewpoint than most other people. So my perception of the world is a bit different. But uh, <clears throat> diarrhea can be diagnosed uh, with stool samples and um, blood cultures as well if it's severe. In fact, the typhoid that kills is in the same areas that malaria is. And it's 
uh, those are the two top two things that you would think of in a return travel with a fever uh, so that you won't let them die and you uh, treat them promptly. So there's a list of personal things, prevention and uh, hygiene things that, that we traditionally tell people before they go. It's been quite clearly shown and written about recently in the literature that it's worthless <laughs> in a lot of ways, but we still do it um, just because um, even though there's not good evidence, it's a, a personal thing. So I read uh, the medical literature. Uh, this is Cosmo. Uh, <clears throat> actually, the editor of Cosmo called me up uh, one summer not too long ago and said, Dr. Smith, uh, would you like to interview with Cosmo? And I said, whoa, wow. And I thought they were going to ask me about this. Uh, number one thing he craves in bed or something you know, cool. But uh, it turns out, actually, they asked me, can I catch anything from a public toilet seat? And can you talk to us about diarrhea? So uh, you have to be careful what uh, you're known for. And I hope uh, <laughs> so this is, this is about uh, so uh, diarrhea and issues of uh, <laughs> Um, you know, it, it shit happens. It's a it's an important thing to know about. This is this is a uh, map of the world with uh, the fecal veneer, meaning where the most densely uh, <clears throat> observed cases of typhoid are. And you can see by the coloration here, greater than 100 per 100,000 cases of typhoid, mostly in Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, and uh, Vietnam. If you look at a close-up of one of these countries and they, you have further definition in the map, you can see that you know, these areas are they're very different even within the country. So uh, again, just to illustrate, mapping is, is a difficult thing. And he who tends to generalize generally lies. And maps are not uh, perfect. So um, a, a list of things that you could do to prevent diarrhea. Uh, these are strategies using antibiotics, and you could, you could uh, take these daily. This is not a usual uh, way anymore, although we used to do this. Uh, people got a little bit careless, said, oh, I'm taking my antibiotic, I'm not going to get diarrhea, and they uh, uh, <laughs> proceed to uh, take too much and, and uh, get diarrhea. Other strategies are if you are ill or develop a fever and can't seek therapy soon, then you can take uh, antibiotic on the spot. And then there's a sort of list of things to look out for and then take the medicine if it's needed. Commonly, we use Cipro, Ciprofloxacin, and uh, um, uh, people, people actually can, can have shown very clearly that there's a, a benefit in their functional abilities while traveling if they carry that with them. OK, the last thing, skin infection. That's the big uh, category after diarrhea of things that people return with after they travel. So travel clinic worries. This is uh, about a woman who was traveling. Here she is. Where did she go, do you think? Uh, she's got a t-shirt here, uh, Che Guevara. She just got back from South America. She was checking out uh, where Che's fingers were buried in Bolivia. Um, <clears throat> anyway, she was more concerned at this moment with her chin and what's on her chin. And here's a close-up. And she was very concerned about this thing that I actually spent a year of my life studying called uh, leishmaniasis. And <laughs> it's a skin um, disorder here. Sorry about your lunches. Uh, <clears throat> a skin disorder that can involve the mucocutaneous membranes. And it turns out she didn't have that, but rather it's a common bacterial infection um, strep. And so we were able to deal with that uh, no problem. But anyway, skin, uh, I guess I'm skin. skin infections are a big issue, especially in, uh, sorry. This, this is leishmania, which is a non-healing skin lesion. Um, and often it uh, just persists on uh, normal glabrous surfaces of the skin, but can involve mucous membranes, like I showed that terrible picture. But um, uh, the more common things are staph and strep. And so she had strep. So this is another interesting case about a guy. He's a, <clears throat> uh, a Googler who came to my clinic. And he had wiggling lumps uh, under his skin. And what could this be? He had just returned from the forests of Belize. And here he is, smiling, and he consented to share his image and uh, picture. 
His arm here has one of the lesions. You can see a big bump here. And in fact, uh, his girlfriend as well. Um, here we are looking at this. It's a little bit hard to appreciate, but there's a nodule under her scalp here and a, a big lesion. And she was also having these funny sensations. So <clears throat> I told her that this uh, was, was possibly a, a a, a meiasis or a fly to put Vaseline on it and then it would uh, suffocate and actually migrate into the Vaseline. She put a big old stack of Vaseline on top of it. Indeed, it migrated in into the Vaseline, came out, and then she mailed this to me in my office. And so I took a picture and I was all proud of myself. You know, the infectious disease doctor made a diagnosis and a medical student came the next day and I showed it to him and he was like, wow, uh, this is another patient with the same disease. And his migrated out, looked like that. And I put it under my microscope, and I took a picture of it. And I said, you know, meiasis times 10 on the microscope, aren't I great? And he said, Dr. Smith, that really sucks. Let me just take that specimen down to Stanford. And so he uh, took it down and took these great electron scanning microscope pictures of, uh, of this terrible thing. But this is actually just an a inch long uh, larvae. Of, of a fly that has a parasitic interrelationship with mosquitoes and a number of different mammals <clears throat> in Central America. So you can see it's hard to get out of the skin because uh, until it's ready to migrate out, it's got all these spines holding it in place. Um, but this is uh, another skin type uh, uh, infection with D Dermatobia hominis, and uh, that's, that's a bot fly. So it's a parasite of many different mammals, uh, endemic in Central and South America. And uh, <clears throat> it, it, it feeds under the skin, comes out if you let it, uh, uh, maybe 10 weeks later. So this is the sequence. We actually isolated what I just showed you, this third stage larva. And uh, <clears throat> that was the story of, uh, uh, of his meiasis. So um, let's see. After seeing all these things, I don't want you to be dissuaded in any way from traveling. It's, traveling is a great thing. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. Or if you want, you know, come to the Redwood City Travel Clinic, get some good advice, make sure that you're prepared and you know what to expect. There are many things actually you can do to prevent that. For example, not letting a mosquito bite could uh, potentially prevent that, the, the meiasis. So this is the summary. Uh, best prevention strategy, don't get bit. Don't get hit. In fact, I didn't go into this, but one of the major causes of fatality in international travelers is um, not wearing seatbelts and motor vehicle accidents. Um, of course, my focus is infection, so don't do it, uh, meaning sexually transmitted diseases. Don't eat shit. And I told you all about typhoid, which is a fecal transmitted. Uh, so the quiz is a best prevention strategy. Uh, <clears throat> which do you pick? Uh, would you like to buy a vowel? Uh, anyway, the answer is all of this stuff. Uh, and there are, the message is, a few things that you can do so that you can have fun on your travels. Um, so that's the end of the travel section here. And, and uh, what I hope to do is actually, um, uh, well, so you can see there are a number of different syndromes. I just went over a couple of this, the, the common ones, fever, diarrhea, and skin. Maps are wrong. They're sometimes useful. We use a whole bunch of different ones to help us give advice. Uh, and I'm hoping, if there's interest, that uh, people would be uh, helpful and we can Googleize uh, information that's out there in sort of unbounded ways um, to, to uh, uh, make better assessments and more efficiently. We talk about Kaiserizing things, information about medical uh, interventions and so on, so that it makes sense and is cost effective and so on. Well, the same thing with mapping and getting strategies together and understanding constraints, now that we have an electronic medical record at Kaiser, can be done. And so uh, uh, it would be great. I've been worrying about these sorts of problems for a long time um, to, to make this possible uh, with, with uh, computers. So if anybody wants to talk about this more. I would be delighted to uh, work on this. I'm uh, at this email address and can be phoned anytime if you have a travel medicine related concern. <laughs> Don't hesitate to call me. And um, <clears throat> these are just a bunch of references. I wanted to show you one movie. I am uh, 
German das hier ist ein All right, we'll skip the movie. Don't worry. Um, <coughs> it's so important to communicate, but hey. Uh, if anybody has any questions or specific things, you're traveling off somewhere far and you're worried, or you want to know what vaccines, I'm help, happy to, to, to try and answer. I'd love to hear about what you guys are doing or what you worry about, too. So anyway. So currently, there's no um, single place you could go to find information on all these things. There is. It's by travel. There is a single place you could go, and that would be a travel clinic that has somebody that's knowledgeable and you know can look at these proprietary uh, software things and and study the maps and kind of look at them and hobble together the recommendations. And that's what we do. So, and actually in a travel clinic, and there are several, they're mapped out. If you go to istm.org, which is the International Travel Society, um, <clears throat> you can find out where the nearest travel clinic is and then go, and they'll be making those recommendations next to a refrigerator full of vaccines and then offer you what might be indicated. So, but it's... it's your own personal study, there's no... For your own like personal reasons, way. I wish there were, and that would be the Googleizing of uh, this knowledge. The knowledge is there. It's unfortunately, uh, I think, in three or four, probably more, proprietary uh, software systems. But remember, they get that information from public sources. And uh, this group at Oxford that I mentioned is uh, 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 you know, putting that together, I think, with maps that WHO has to, makes publicly available, and, and uh, then, you know, expert opinion and that sort of thing. So there, there's lots of influences as well, of course, from the manufacturers of the medicines and the vaccines, and, you know, making good judgments based on real risk is, is the challenge, and that's what I would uh, hope to be able to do, to overlay maps of the risks of all the preventable diseases, and then put your personal electronic medical record, apply that to the information in front of you based on your destinations and then decide what is it that we can do to minimize your risk and optimize your happiness beyond Disneyland. So anyway, <laughs> any other? Where are you going next? I have a question. What's it take to get a prescription for antibiotics when you're going out there? What's it take? Just a few yeah. bucks? He wouldn't give you one? That's mean. What? Uh, you know, I scratch, got scratched on a bush or something. And, and a few I days. Off, I'm sorry? I went out for a weekend and, uh, you know, just got scratched on a bush or something. And a few, a few days later, my leg was all infected. Uh -huh. And of course, I was home, so I went to the doctor, but it wasn't a problem. Yeah. Other times, I go out for a week. What happens if I got scratched on the first day of that week? Then three or four days later, I'd have a problem and I'd be a long way from a doctor. and. Treatment. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, uh, we do this all the time. Expedition medicine, often we make kits, and for people that are going in groups like that, and those issues always come up, there are uh, antibiotics that would be carried. I mean, I prepared some people for a canoe trip in the middle of nowhere in Canada, and we put lots of morphine and other things just in case, you know, bones are broken and what have you. But yeah, you, you can never really prepare, but <clears throat> there are some very basic things, and that's one of them that you would include in a kit, prescription medicines. We control drugs and uh, those things differently than most every other country. <clears throat> and that's a problem, and that's actually a benefit, too. And an example of the problem would be in a third world where, country where you can get access to any antibiotic, because there's huge resistance to tuberculosis because of willy-nilly use of the few drugs that we have. Um, and <clears throat> that's beginning to be an issue in some cases here uh, with resistance, but uh, yeah, you can buy the right antibiotic in every country south of here, uh, just over the counter, without a doctor. Anyway, it's our system, <laughs> for better or worse. So where are you going next? No passport? Uh, how much you passport? Uh, probably China. China? OK, I'll be there in June. You're going to go see the Olympics. <laughs> For China, apart from uh, uh, hepatitis A, that would be the main uh, vaccine-preventable thing that you would want if you're traveling to China. 
And most people, either if you're born there or you're a certain age, you may already have immunity. You might check a serology and prevent going through the series of hepatitis A vaccines. And that's easier to do than two vaccines. So if you know you're immune, then you're done. Or if you've had the two, and that's it. But there's not malaria unless you go to the south part of China, Yunnan, and at certain times of year and so on. So yeah, uh, China is always a big question. A lot of people go there for touristic reasons. And the whole country is colored in as malaria. But it's only because this one little area down in the south part, Yunnan, um, has a little bit of vivax. So you have to look carefully where and what you're doing when you prescribe. So don't worry about it. You're probably just going to Beijing. I don't know, Shanghai. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you, guys. It was fun. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah.